Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at Newton's third law of motion, which says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if you are on a skateboard and you're pushing on the ground with one of your feet, you, the, you're pushing back on the ground. The ground is pushing at the same force you are back on you. If you, di if you push with more force than the ground, you'll go into the ground. Okay, so for instance, a cannonball comes in uh, for a landing, it is going to hit the ground with such force that it's actually opposing the ability for the dirt to bounce back and you'll end up with a hole. So if uh, Superman uh, hits the table so hard, he will go right through the table, okay? So because there's a limit to what the table can do ba based on what the table is made out of. But as long as it's something sturdy enough, for every action that you put into something, there will be an equal and opposite reaction. I hit the tennis ball with my tennis racket. The ball is hitting my racket with the same force that my racket is hitting the ball. Okay, so all of this is gonna uh, allow us to find that there are pairs of reactions. There's, a, there's something doing it and something getting it done back to them. And then you're ending up with motion based on the object of which one is, can be accelerated faster. Okay, so if two people are on ice skates, you have a big guy and a little guy and they bump into each other, both of them are gonna move, uh, but the smaller one's gonna move faster. So this is all a lesson on third law. First thing we're gonna talk about is the fact that you can't exert a force on something without some kind of interaction with those two objects. So if you hit a bug with your windshield, the windshield is exerting a force on the bug, and the force is substantial enough to squish the bug, but the bug is also exerting an equal force on the, wind, on the windshield. So if you do have a force, you're gonna have an interaction. So if you push the basketball with your hand to accelerate it, for instance, you're also shoving your hand back with the ball. The ball is exerting a force on your hand equal to the force that you're exerting with your hand on the ball. Newton expressed it in his third law, whenever an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. So for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, there is a always a pair of, of forces. There is a pair that are opposed to each other uh, acting on different objects. So if you are pushing on the wall and the wall is pushing on you, the, the getting pushed is two different things. Then um, those, those are called reaction, action, reaction forces. And they're a co-pair co with the single reaction. You push on the ball, the ball pushes on you, it's one thing happening, but two things are pushing on the opposite object, okay? And then you can't have a force without that opposing force. They always are in the same magnitude and opposite directions, and they always act on different objects. For instance, if I push on a box and you push on a box, okay, well, that's actually two different things because you're pushing on a box, the box is pushing on you. I'm pushing on a box, the box is pushing on me. Those are the react the the um, action reaction pairs. You can't say that I'm pushing on the box and the box and you're pushing on the box and somehow I'm pushing on you. It's it's what is what are the two reacting objects? Sometimes these uh, pairs are not obvious, so it's kind of easy when you say I'm shoving on the basketball, the basketball is exerting a force on my hand, or the, the oar is exerting a force on the water, and the water is pushing the oar, which propels the boat. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. In case of, say, a car driving on the, on the road, what is causing the motion of the car? The tires are exerting a force onto the road, because of the axles of the car, the road then is actually pushing the car along due to its friction force. So sometimes they're, they're easy to see and sometimes they're, they're a little bit not so obvious uh, to see. 
the example here is a rocket, and a rocket can be a, a hard one. I think that's actually, I wouldn't have put this on this slide. If you are putting a rocket and it's, it is exerting heated gases out the tailpipe, and those gases hit against the ground, all right, well, that makes sense. The ground is then exerting an equal and opposite force up on the system and pushes the rocket forward, okay? Just like a, a, a balloon that you let go is shoving against the air, okay? So there's air in the room, there's air in the balloon, the balloon shoves against the air, the air in the room is shoving back against the air particles in the balloon and the balloon goes forward. In the case of going out in space, how does a rocket work? If there is nothing to oppose it, that's, that's a little hard. What will happen is the rocket pushes on the gas. So it has expelled gases and now the rocket is shoving new gases into those gases and then the gases that are there at the tail of the rocket is pushing the rocket forward. So you always have to try to, uh, to identify the force and the, or the, um, what are the two pairs, what are the two parts of the pairs? So the action force, reaction force. If you can get them to where you know that they, that they um, one's pushing on one, the other's pushing on one, you'll always have motion. If two things are pushing equal and opposite, say on a box, the box is not going to move. There's no movement. But if, if I'm pushing on a box and the box is pushing on me, there either could be movement if, if I'm pushing harder or not movement if that box is so heavy that I can't push it due to its uh, higher friction force than my strength. I like this slide. I like how it, it teaches. I think it's a good idea. They simply took Newton's second law, which you remember is force equals mass times acceleration, and they, so, they solved for acceleration, okay? Now the force of the cannon on the cannonball is equal to the force the cannonball exerts on the cannon, all right? This is called recoil. Imagine you shoot a, a rifle, you shoot a shotgun, and your, your gun kicks. Why does it kick? All right, so you, you have an exploding uh, gas on the inside of that barrel. The gas is pushing against, uh, or the force of the, of the bullet is pushing against the gas and the back of the gun. It propels forward, okay? So the bullet, which weighs a little bit, has a huge force, and so it accelerates quickly. The gun has the exact same force that was put on the bullet, is put on the gun, but the gun weighs a lot, and so it has a small acceleration. The gun goes back backwards, the bullet goes forwards with the same force, but the bullet, bullet weighing so much less than the gun is accelerated much faster than the gun. The gun simply kicks back, but the bullet is projected out of the, out of the uh, barrel. So here they've got the cannonball, which is the small mass, because a cannon weighs more than the cannonball, same force, little mass, so take a number and divide it by a little number, and you get a big number. So 10 divided by two is five, right? But in the bottom number, if that mass of a cannon is huge, let's say 10 divided by 100, and now you get an acceleration of 0.1. So you see, so the smaller the mass, the greater the acceleration, and this is just a good way, I think, to show that. The headache in trying to find the reaction, uh, action reaction pair is that sometimes they're not always obvious, okay? I mentioned that once before. So I've got um, an orange, I don't know why I have an orange in a car, but I've got an orange in a car. If the orange is in the car, there's nothing the orange can do to make the car go forward because the orange can't put a force on itself Right? In order for the cart that has the orange in it to go forward or backwards, a force has to be exerted from the outside on the cart. Either a pulling force, like a towing force, or a pushing force. Either way. So that, if you sit inside your car and push with all your might onto the steering wheel, the car is not going to go forward because you are part of the car. So it's not just the car or the orange, but the the orange in the car is considered one system. You inside your car can't push your car. If you want to push your car, you have to get outside the car 
and now the car is one system, you are a second system, and you can exert a force on the car. But if you're inside the car, no matter how hard you push, you can't do it because you're part of that system. So Mr. Apple, I guess, is pulling uh, Susie Orange in the cart because the, the apple is exerting a force on the ground. The ground is pushing the apple forward, and as long as he has enough strength, he can pull the cart. It's an external force that has to move a system. You can't move a system within itself. Just to confuse you more, if you consider the system of being the orange and the apple, okay, then both of those would have to be accelerated by an external force still. Okay? So the, the orange and the apple, if they're thought of as different, then you could have motion. If you're thought of as the same, then you would have to have an external force to the whole system because you can't move a system within the system. You have to have an external force doing it. That's why that you learned an object at, re at rest remains at rest, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an external force. It's the same idea. You're just considering a system of objects, even if they're in motion, as one thing. Okay. So for instance, I can have a pocket watch and lots of motion going on inside the pocket watch, but I could toss you my pocket watch and now the whole pocket watch is thought of as a system and if I want to accelerate the whole thing, I would have to put an external force on it. So going back to the idea that the apple and the orange could be thought of as separate or as one thing, okay? Let's imagine that we're playing tug of war. I pull on the rope, you pull on the rope. Okay, I pull on the rope with a certain force, and it um, and the force that you are exerting on the rope would be the same. It's actually easier if I would tie the rope to a tree. If I tie the rope to a tree and pull on the rope, the tree is pulling on the rope the same strength as I am. If I pull harder, the tree pulls harder. And you're thinking, how could that happen? How's the tree pulling? It's because it's countering my pull. There, that tree it. I would have to be ridiculously strong to pull the roots out of the ground of a tree. So as l whatever amount of strength that I could do, the tree opposes that strength. Okay, That's an internal system, and they cancel. So there's a, there's a canceling. The apple pulling the orange or a, or a kid pulling a wagon, it's the system of the road is now involved. Okay, The, the, the boy's hand pulling on the cart is equal to the pull of the cart on his hand. But if you add the fact that he's also pushing with his foot on the ground and the ground is propelling him, that allows there to be movement. So there always has to be an external force. I think I beat this point to death. So final point, if you're in the system, your forces cancel, okay? So I push on the steering wheel, the steering wheel pushes on me, the cart does not move. But if I'm outside and I push on the ground, the ground pushes on me and I'm attached to the car and I push the car, as long as it's in neutral, then you might have some movement. You have to have an external force.